Hi, it's Andy, and today I'm going to give you some recommendations that I think would be good for all. First off, I have filmed another video today, and I'm not sure which one I'm going to put up first, so I will just acknowledge that my shelves are a bit all over the place at the moment. Um, I have been moving things around, and they're not quite finished yet, but... I'm not, I'm not overly displeased, I'm not gonna lie. Also, I'm still ill, so you're getting congested, Andy. I just, this is the best I can do um, <laughs> to get this video filmed, so I apologise if my congested voice gets on your nerves. So what the plan is for this video is literally just me showing you books that I've set aside that I think would be autumnal reads, things that were just like yelling autumn at me um, for various reasons that I will go through as I'm showing you them. So I'm just going to get right into it because I I went a little bit overboard, okay? So the first thing kind of felt like a given, this was the first book I thought of because I had, I just, I had to. I had to. And that is Shakespeare and Autumn. Um, so this is a very specific thing. Um, this is select plays and complete sonnets of Shakespeare and I don't expect you to sit and read this entire thing, like that's a joke, but um, because it's obviously Shakespeare in Autumn and it's this beautiful cut out edition, I just had to, I just had to be like, <laughs> this one. So this is kind of half a joke pick because, you know, nobody's going to sit and read all of this, but maybe you want to read some Shakespeare, maybe you want to do some sonnets. You know? You, I don't know, but yeah, I just wanted to show you this beautiful edition of Shakespeare and all. Next is the sort of Stock of Jack the Ripper series. I don't know if there's another name for this series, uh, by Kenny Maniscalco. This follows Aubrey Rose, who is a niece, the niece of a forensic pathologist, although that's not what he's called at the time, but that's it's basically what he is. He's a forensic investigator and forensic pathologist. And this is set at the time of Jack the Ripper. So there are four books in this series, so if you have read one, two, or three, whatever, feel free to pick up the next one as my recommendation. But generally this series it is crime based. I don't know if I'd call it a crime book. It probably is a crime book, but it is quite not that gruesome. Well, I don't think it's that gruesome. But you know, the talks about autopsies and stuff like that and Jack the Ripper and his victims and stuff like that. All the while Aubrey Rose and Thomas and her uncle are trying to figure out who Jack the Ripper is. And again, the other three in the series are also different crimes. So there's stalking Jack the Ripper, hunting Prince Dracula, uh, hiding from Houdini? Something from Houdini. And then the fourth one set at the World Fair. I cannot <laughs> remember for the life of me what it's called. Um, but they're all based on real criminals, real crimes, real things, you know, in history. And I just love this series so much. Next is a book that is fairly similar, but not quite. Um, and that is Anatomy, A Love Story. So the main character of Anatomy, A Love Story, whose name is Hazel, wants to be a surgeon. She wants to be a doctor, she wants to be a surgeon. And so she dresses up as a boy, as a man, to go and sit in the surgeon's class. But it's discovered that she is a woman and so she makes this deal with the surgeon that if she can pass the exam on her own, he will take her on as a student. And so she teams up with Jack, who is a resurrection man. And what that means is they are the people that would dig up freshly dead bodies from their graves and sell them to surgeons and to doctors and stuff like that um, to practice their anatomy on because at the time there wasn't enough criminals being killed to supply what they needed and so she teams up with Jack to get her bodies so that she could do her own research. She is currently at home, her mum is with her brother or someone else because her brother's ill I think, I can't remember quite what it is, um, but she wants to study these bodies but there's also a bigger mystery going on in the background because people are going missing and when they're coming back, they're coming back not completely whole. And by not completely whole, I mean like missing eyes, missing limbs, missing <laughs> certain body parts, but they're not dead. And so she's like, what's going on here? 
and so they have to kind of figure that out at the same time. This is very similar, like it's got a very similar premise kind of to Stock and Jack the Ripper, like this to me, Aubrey Rose and Hazel would probably get on really really well. They're both from rich families, they both have a love of anatomy and this sort of thing, like Aubrey Rose wants to be a pathologist, like her uncle, um, and she wants to be a surgeon, so it's very similar, but this has a little bit more of a magical element in it as well. Next is a more recent one, and that is An Education in Malice by S.T. Gibson. This is a vampire-based book. It's kind of a sequel companion to A Dowry of Blood, which I would also recommend, but you can read it without reading Dowry. You just won't get the little, like, Easter eggs, I suppose, but you can read it without reading Dowry. You don't need to read Dowry. Um, this I picked because it is also Dark Academia, and Dark Academia is, all, is one of the things that people like to read around about autumn because schools go back. There's a few in here where it'll be like, schools go back in autumn, so, you know, <laughs> universities go back in September, our schools go back in August. It's very much like start of the school year, academic year sort of thing is in the autumn, and so things like Dark Academia just seem to thrive at this time of year. This follows our main character, Laura, and it is a Carmilla retelling. So there's Laura and Carmilla, and as this is a, almost, it is a companion sequel to Dowry, vampires do exist in this world. And so Laura kind of gets herself wrapped up in Camilla, as it is a Camilla, Carmilla retelling. Sorry, it's because I'm congested. And they also have a slight wrap up in the vampire world. Um, I don't want to say too much, but this is set, I think, in the 60s in Boston, Massachusetts, or definitely Massachusetts anyway, at a girls' university. And yeah, I really enjoy this. I don't know how else to describe this. It's dark academia, gothic vibes um, with vampires and sapphic relationships. So even if you've not read Dowry, like I say, you can read this. This is not like Dowry in the sense that Dowry covers abuse. This doesn't as much, although there are other forms of abuse isn't the right word, but um like there's like teacher student relationships, there's imbalances of power, things like that. So if that's not something you're you know want to read, do check the trigger warnings and stuff like that. I think ST Gibson does put the um yeah, she puts the trigger warnings into an author's note um at the front. So yeah, because she's not shy about using some pretty harsh things. Next is the first of witchy book and that is A Wayward by Emily, Amelia Hart. Oh my god, my throat is not working. And this follows three women at three different points in time. And it centres around this house. Um, I think it's called Wayward Cottage. It's been a while since I've read this. But this looks a lot at power dynamics when it comes to women and relationships and the abuses that women face. In, again, different ways. You've got one character who's running from an abusive relationship, one character who has been cast aside by her family, and another character who is just trying to figure out certain things around relationships with her, her family. And each of these women is drawn to Weaver Cottage for particular reasons. And I really enjoyed this. I love split timeline books. You all know I love split timeline books. This also has magic ingrained in it because there is a sort of witchy thread and power that goes throughout, so it's like magical realism sort of book. Again, one that I would check trigger warnings on because it can get quite vile and violent. Vile is maybe the wrong word, but like some of the men in this are vile. This is also the most beautiful edition ever. Like if this does not scream witchy at you, I don't know, I don't know what does. But I really enjoyed this, I highly recommend, and I'm so glad I got this edition. Next we'll go for another witchy one, and that is A Discovery of Witches. I love this series. This is one of my favourite series of all time. I was gutted the other day when I couldn't go and see Diana Gabaldon. Like, I was so ill. I had Covid and I couldn't go to see Diana Gabaldon. But, like, you'll see I have started annotating this. Um, the different colours do mean different things. Did I take a note of what the colours mean? No. But I started highlighting it. And only got so far through because I just wanted to... I didn't want to, like, slowly go through it. I wanted to really just sit down and read it. I usually read this, I used to read this every year, but I've kind of gone off for the past couple of years because my TBR is getting out of hand. But this is, again, it's like, it's witchy, it's dark academia, there are vampires, there are demons, there are creatures. And this follows Diana, who is a witch from a very powerful family, but she doesn't seem to have 
much power. Instead, she is an academic and she is over studying at Oxford. She's on like a sabbatical year and so she's gone to Oxford to study and while she's in the Bodleian Library, she pulls out a manuscript that suddenly everybody's interested in and when she puts it back in the stack, she can't recall it again. The creatures feel the pull of this manuscript and they start coming around Diana to try and get her to pull this manuscript for them. One of those creatures is Matthew, Matthew de Clermont, and he is, you know, our love interest in this, obviously. And it also makes it harder for them because, like, creatures aren't meant to mingle together because the more they mingle, the more humans start to notice them. So you've got this kind of, like, love story wrapped up in this mystery, wrapped up in a lot more political intrigue that's going on in the world. Someone said this is like adult Twilight and I see it. I see it and I'm not necessarily <laughs> happy that I see it, but I totally see it. Um, this series overall I love so, so much. It means so much to me. Um, I know that it's just recently more people have been reading it and it's not everybody's cup of tea. The second book gets very historical and Diana Gabaldon is a historian as well. Why am I saying Diana Gabaldon? How many times have I said that? Have I been saying Diana Gabaldon? Oh, Deborah Harkness. <laughs> is a historian. Diana Gabaldon is also a historian, but Deborah Harkness, who actually wrote this, is a historian and so she puts a lot of her research and history and her academic brain into writing this book and so it's not for everybody because it does lean towards that sort of, um, what's the word for it? Oh, what's the word for it? You know, like the snooty sort of academic type. There's a, it's a P word and I can't remember what it is, but I think it's a P-word anyway. Anyway, but yeah, it's, I love it. This, um, this series, I just love it so much. Next is A Monster Calls by Patrick Ness. I love this book so, so much. Also, like, I've got two copies of it because I love this book so much. This is about a boy called Connor and every night he has the same dream about this monster coming, um, to his window and speaking to him. And this is like, I don't even know how to describe this. This is a very sort of twisted look on mental health. So the monster isn't a monster, but it is a monster. It's like, not like a scary monster horror type thing. Like, don't think of it like that. Um, the monster represents sort of his mental health or mental health in general and coping mechanisms and things like that because there's a lot going on in Connor's life. Um, he is a child as well, so it's like the figment of a child's, like the, the, the personification of a child's mental state. I really don't know how else to represent that. I don't know how to like represent this book and describe it. Um, but every night this monster comes to him and the monster asks him to tell the truth and it will not stop coming until he tells the truth. It is a relatively short book. It is very hard hitting. As you can see, the text, that was a bad page to turn to. Doesn't take up much of the book at all. It is a very fast read, but it is such a poignant read. And just with that added element of the monster and the, the atmosphere that it brings up is just why I think it's such a great autumnal read. Again, because it's to do a lot with mental health and stuff like that, if that's not something you're comfortable reading, I would maybe set it aside or, you know, not bother with it for now. Next is probably the only just straight up mystery thr thriller that I have on my shelves and that is Precious Thing by Colette Macbeth. This, I, I don't know if this is, a, I don't know if this is like objectively a good thriller or not but it's the only thriller I've read and actually finished because normally I start them and I'm like I don't like this but this follows our main character who had this best friend and follows them, I think, does it go back and forward? I can't remember, but it follows these two best friends and then one of them goes missing and the main character is a journalist and she's sent to cover this because they know it's in her hometown. But at the same time, she also wants to know what happened to her friend. But then the police start to look at her because they're suspicious that she has had something to do with it. This, to me, this book was twisty turny and like, I didn't know what was going on at any point, which is, I think, the point of thrillers. And mysteries like there's a mystery I didn't I never worked it out <laughs> but that might be just because I don't read thrillers and mysteries somebody who's well seasoned in mystery thrillers might read this and be like this is awful this is so blatantly obvious what's going to happen for me as someone who doesn't read things like this I absolutely loved it the atmosphere was great um this sort of like seaside town where 
like it just the atmosphere was great i loved the whole story and yeah maybe if you're not a mystery thriller reader this might be something that you will enjoy next up is the library of the dead or again anything in the series by Tail Hutchu. This book in this series has been one of my favourites to read. Um, Tail Hutchu is a Scottish Zimbabwean author and so he has just created this world. It is a dystopian futuristic Edinburgh. So like futuristic in the sense that like it's in the future but not like futuristic as in like there's like sci-fi elements but it's more magical like dystopian type story if that makes sense. So this follows our main character Ropa who is Zimbabwean Scottish and she has magic that has been passed down from her like matrilineal line and because of this Ropa can talk to ghosts she's a ghost talker and what that means is she brings ghosts forward so like they exist anyway but she uses a, a musical instrument I can't pronounce what I can't pronounce it properly I can't remember what it's what it is exactly but she uses this magical magical instrument she uses this musical instrument to allow the her magic to kind of flow and get these ghosts to to sort of materialize and then she takes requests and she gets paid for those requests so she will negotiate with the ghost and then go to that ghost family and say i have a message this is the payment we've agreed on and the family pay her and she passes on the message from the ghost allowing them to go to the other side sort of finished business sort of idea but at the same time there's also this mystery going on because children are going missing and one of the ghosts her son has gone missing and she asks her to find him but Ropa's not going to get paid for this so she doesn't really want to do it because her family live in sort of slum-like conditions so they live in like a static caravan in this slum lord's land and it's just her her little sister and her grandmother and her grandmother is ill and you know doesn't really leave the place at all and so it is Ropa's responsibility to look after this family even though she's only like 14 but because Ropa's also a bleeding heart and because she is thinking what if that was my little sister she decides to take up this mystery and try and find out what's happened to this child and so she gets roped into the world of Scottish magic as well um, entering obviously into the library of the dead which is a magical library and um, where she meets friends and things like that people that want to help her and yeah so this overall kind of covers Ropa getting introduced and getting to embroiled with Scottish magic because it's different from her magic but because she has magic the Scottish magicians kind of want to know what's going on so she gets embroiled in Scottish magic all the way through this and each different book is set at a different place and with a different mystery involved it's kind of I thought this was going to be like a big overarching thing but it's not there's like or there might be and I've just not seen it yet but each book is its own individual thing but it serves you to read them all I just really enjoy this. This is fantastic. It mixes Zimbabwean and Scottish magic and mythology and stories together in a way that is just seamless and beautiful and I cannot praise this book enough. Next is The Cask Girls by Alice Arden. Again, whole series. Absolutely love it. This follows, again, some school children. School children. They're high school students. So, again, school starting in the blah, 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 blah. But this also follows vampires and witches etc in New Orleans. This is set in New Orleans after a Katrina-like storm. It's not named as Katrina but it is it has been taken from um, inspiration from Katrina. So that's like directly from the author as well. Like she mentioned it in a post the other day that it's like Katrina-esque storm. She has written about New Orleans in a way that is just unbelievable. It's so viscerally like all your senses get involved in this the way she writes it's it's so unbelievable like I don't think I've got anybody else I can say has written a place so much better than Alice Arden like the way she writes New Orleans it's just so clear that she knows her way around New Orleans like the back of her hand but this also follows New Orleans as you can imagine it so it is it has been destroyed by the storm and people are sort of slowly making their way back home just to discover homes that may have been damaged may be unsalvageable their lives have been completely changed forever um but also there were people in there that didn't make it and this element does come into it like she really digs in to the post-Katrina efforts of like re-establishing New Orleans at the same time as you're embroiled in the mystery with the witches and the vampires I love this series so so much it just keeps getting better every single book 
and honestly if you pick this up I guarantee you will not regret it. Next is Love Letters and Thirst Tonics by Hayley Blackwood. This is a more recent book that I've gotten and the second book I'm so excited for it but this is set in a small town or village um, where the main character whose name again Fiella Fee has had some issues where her shop literally fell down around her ears and so our main line character again whose name Red um, Red is sent to help her and he's the only other vampire in town but there are some issues so there are things befalling the town and like, like her shop falling down her best friend also is a witch and she makes tonics like thirst tonics and um yeah the last one turned Fiella's hair blue it's not meant to do that and so you're kind of watching these characters try to figure out what's going on. Well, also there's a love story in there as well. It's just this town though, the, the, the town sort of lore is so rich and tantalising. Like there's something going on, but I don't know what it is. And she's not revealed it, but it's going to be like continuing in the next bit. I'm like, I actually like I commented on something. I was like, I need to find out about the cats. And she was like, oh. <laughs> Well, the more, there's more cats in the next book and I'm like ah because there's something with these cats like there's something with these cats this is also um I think it's You've Got Mail is the, the movie that everybody likes so Fiella and Red end up communicating through these magical post boxes so they're like those American ones you know with the little, the little door but they're made of stone and it used to be that they were when magic existed strongly in this world you could put a letter in and it would go to whoever's mailbox you needed it to be regardless of distance but now the magic has dimmed so much that it doesn't work but at one point I think one of them I can't remember who it is one of them puts a letter in to the thing and it goes to the other one and so they start writing to each other back and forward and getting these magical letters back and forward and fall in love with each other while at the same time like they actually cannot stand each other outside of it like, they don't know it's each other they're writing to, but then, like, when they see each other, they don't like each other. It's, it's a whole, you know what I mean, I hope. Anyway, um, yeah, I love this. This is an indie book as well, so, you know, it's definitely worth looking at indie authors. Castle Girls is indie published. This is indie published. Like, support indie authors. Like, Hayley Blackwood has written such a good book. It's not even that long. Such a good book, and I'm so looking forward to the second one. Next is another um, sort of magical fantasy type book, and that is Rhapsodic, or again, the entire series by Laura Thalassa. These are the gorgeous indie versions, which are no longer available. Um, they're out of print because Laura Thalassa was picked up by a traditional publisher, and so these covers are no longer available because they have their own covers, which I can't decide if I hate them or not. I kind of hate them, but I can't decide if I hate them enough or not. But I might get them. I don't know. We will see. This follows Callie, who did something when she was younger and requested the help of the bargainer. Now the bargainer is this creature in this world and he, Desmond Flynn, is someone that you don't really want to mess with. So people make bargains with him and he comes and collects. Like, And in some brutal ways he's well known as like somebody not to mess with in this world. But Callie makes a deal with the bargainer and then continues to make deals with the bargainer. She has a bracelet of beads all the way up her arm and each one of the beads is a favour she owes to the bargainer but it's been seven years and the bargainer has not come to collect until suddenly he reappears and <sighs> honestly I love this series so so much like I love it I love it so so much it is so so good just mm, I love it so much um yeah I this is a world like it's like our world but fae like things exist so there are fae there are werewolves there are sirens there are witches there are all these different creatures and they just kind of get on with it like they're just sort of there in the world i don't know how else to explain it but yeah i i really really love this book and the whole series next is one again that has a laundry list of trigger warnings and that is the magicians by Liv Brosnan. this again series absolutely love it it's this one's based on a magic school. The first one kind of only, only the first one covers a magic school and then we move on to other things. Um, but this is kind of like dark academia. It's not really dark academia, but it leans in a little bit to the dark academia, but it's also effectively a very adult and very dark Narnia retelling. Like, it's a really dark Narnia retelling. I mean dark, dark. Because, like I say, trigger warnings in this, it's like Oprah's giving them out. So you get a trigger warning, you get a trigger warning, you get a trigger warning. It is ridiculous. So um, 
if you can think of it, it's probably in here. I'm not even going to lie. Um, except animals. Animals do not get harmed, which I like, because that's the only thing I can't read, is animals getting harmed. Anyway, this, <laughs> this follows Quentin, and he finds his way into Break Bell's Academy, where he has to sit an exam to see whether he has magical abilities. And so he passes this exam and ends up going to Break Bell's instead of going to, like, a university outside, because he's, like... Smart, smart. And also, at the same time, Quentin is obsessed with this book series called Fillory. And Fillory is basically Narnia. Um, and so he believes that if magic is real, that Fillory is real. And so he kind of goes between this in the series, kind of wanting to find Fillory and also the magic school and, and the consequences of magic and the consequences of working with beings and things that you don't understand. Again, this gets really, really dark, but I absolutely love it. The sort of Narnia-esque component of it in Fillory is just... I love it so much. Next, on a little bit of a lighter note, is A Witch's Guide to Fake Day and a Demon. Again, just the series in general. This is set in a cosy little town where magic sort of thrives. There are ley lines, and so magical creatures and people kind of, kind of end up in this town. And this follows our main character, who is a witch, but she's not a very good witch, I'm not going to lie. And she accidentally summons a demon. And throughout this, he can't leave until he gets her soul. And she's like, uh, no, not going to happen. And so he kind of has to follow her around this whole time. And they end up, obviously it's a, it's a romance, so like they end up to get like fallen in love. But it's just such a fun, funny story. Like she's trying to work out her magic because she's extremely powerful, but she's not very good. Her family are awful and not very helpful. And at the same time, this demon kind of comes into our life. And it's just, honestly, this was Megrek. And it is one of the ones that's just, like, top tier. I absolutely love this. I love the whole series. And I'm so excited to read the third one. Next up, I think this just kind of, like, answers its own question as to why it's in this video. And that is Heartstopper by Alice Oseman. This is set at school. They go back to school in August, September time. Sue me. Also with the leaves and the, the drawing style and just the things in this, like it, it just gives autumnal vibes, you know? And this is just I just wanted to show off this beautiful edition as well. Harshopper, as we all know, has my heart and soul. It has me in a chokehold. And the last one comes out I think this year or next year, start next year, and I'm so upset that it's ending. But I also really want the book. <laughs> so um if you don't know Harshopper, this is a graphic novel written by Alice Oseman and drawn by Alice Oseman and it follows Nick and Charlie and Charlie is gay and has been outed at school and suffered from severe bullying the year prior and then this year he gets sat next to Nick Nelson who is like the rugby star of the school and they become friends and Nick starts to realise that maybe he's not as straight as he thinks he was and so this is about Nick and Charlie falling in love and Nick dealing with the idea of not being straight, while at the same time Charlie is also dealing with a lot of mental health issues. Again, especially later on in the series, you have a lot of mental health triggers um, to, to be looked at because Charlie has a lot of serious issues when it comes to his mental health. So if that's not something you can you can read, like that's fair enough. But this is just such a wholesome, lovely series and I love it so, so, so much. Next up is the Asylum by Karen Coles. This again is like a thriller mystery, but it's like a historical thriller mystery. And this follows a woman who's in an asylum and she doesn't know why she's in the asylum until this new doctor comes and starts these treatments. And this is like one of those asylums that were like back in, you know, they did horrible things to people. And so it's quite dark in that sense, but she's also starting to have memories come back of how she ended up in this asylum and again it's quite dark it's quite um triggery material in this book i remember reading this and just being absolutely drawn in the whole time like i was wanting to know what's going to happen next what's going to happen next what's going to happen next because it's this whole thing of like is the main character actually crazy and does she belong in this asylum or is she a victim who has been put in here to keep her quiet and you really Karen Coles really really holds this up where like you don't know if you can trust the narrator you don't know if you can trust the main character um but at the same time you almost want to because you know that these places were not good and you know that these places were um 
the way they treated their, their patients and stuff like that. Like, nobody deserves to be in there. So, yeah, this, I just remember the feeling this gave me. And it's just, again, one of those things that I just could not put down. Next is one that I think, again, you're going to agree with me, gives major autumnal vibes especially in spooky season and that is Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. I have this gorgeous edition and I absolutely love it. Frankenstein is one of my favourite classics of all time. Like I love Frankenstein. It is such a fantastic book. It is the classic that we all know about Victor Frankenstein and him building this monster but who really ends up being the most monstrous, him or the creature that he builds. I did not appreciate this story until I read it like the movies and stuff do not do it justice the prose in this is beautiful the ideas the sci-fi the the darkness in it is incredible and there will be audiobooks and stuff available for this as well like the one I read had like you could hear like the lightning and the wind and like the sound effects and stuff like that absolutely loved it but yeah Frankenstein honestly in my opinion is like the best of the, the classics like if you're talking about the like the main three so you've got Jekyll and Hyde, Frankenstein and Dracula this is the best one hands down this is the best one Mayor Shelley's writing is just something else. Next is The Spirit Engineer by AJ West this is a historical fiction with like thrillery mystery paranormal elements in it this is based on the life of a real man and it is also set Two years after the sinking of the Titanic, when seances and things like that were getting popular, people wanted to talk to their loved ones who had died and there were people willing to take advantage of that at the time. And so our main character is out to prove that these people are frauds, but gets embroiled into the world because he starts to realise that they might not be as fraudulent as he thought they were. Next up is People of Abandoned Character by Claire Whitfield. This this is just in here because I really, I don't know, I just feel like this is, again, it's one of those historical fiction mystery type books. Um, so our main character, basically she thinks her husband is Jack the Ripper and she kind of ha has to go out and prove it because she can't just be like, oh, my husband's Jack the Ripper because one, you might offer, two, nobody's going to believe her. Like, this is 1888. Women don't have that kind of position. But also, there are things happening in her household that she doesn't quite trust. She's in a position that is very precarious. And so she has to try and find out what's happening with her husband before she becomes his next victim. Again, did not know what to expect with this book, but I ended up really liking it. If you like historical fictions with that kind of, like, creepy lean-in, I would say this is the book for you. If you're not into historical fictions, I would stay away from this because this is really, really into like heavy historical fiction. I mean, it's, it's 1888 is based in, but at the same time, there's also this like background of the fear and the stress and stuff like that. You can really feel through the writing. So yeah, I think this is very well written. And again, it's got that creepy sort of vibe that I just think that a lot of people look forward to during spooky season. And the last book you'll be glad to hear is The Lost Book of Salem by Catherine Howe. This is set... Uh, not around the Salem Witch Trials, but also, yes, around Salem Witch Trials. So it follows the main character, again, whose name I can't remember, um, Connie. And Connie is cleaning out her grandmother's cottage to sell it. But she lives in, like, Salem in Massachusetts. Um, and she teaches at the local university, but she teaches history. And this, again, is one of those, like, academic love story crossovers. Like, if you like... In Discovery Witches, I think you'll like this. Although none of them, like, there's no creatures like there are in Discovery Witches. It's just, a Discovery, yeah, Discovery Witches. It is just, like, witches. She is descended from Salem Witches. And there is somebody out to get her, but she needs to figure out what the hell is going on. While also finding out that she is actually a witch. So, like, she doesn't know that her family are witches. But through cleaning out her grandmother's cottage, she starts to get this tingle, this inkling, this, this feeling of power. And then, like I say, somebody is out to get her. I love this book so much. Like, this book, I've not read it in years. And yet, this book lives in my mind rent-free. Um, I think it's great as well, because Catherine Howe is also a historian. And so she can put a lot of actual fact into this. And Catherine Howe is also descended of two women who were tried at Salem, or at least imprisoned at Salem. Which I think is so cool, like... 
she's looked at her family history and gone like I want to to write about that in a way that's a lot, a lot more fantastical but yeah this does jump back and forward in time a little bit but not a lot but it very much like this is the book I'm talking about when I'm talking about uh, language and etymology and not necessarily etymology but like for example um there's no there was no sort of standardized spelling type thing in America at the time and so when she's going through records she finds it really difficult because some people might spell things differently some people may pronounce things differently and so when you pronounce it differently it gets spelled differently and it just you, my friends will have heard me talking about this before um like there's names and things like that that you say in a different way depending on your accent and then it can be spelled differently and it's just yeah I just love this book so much the way it talks about the progression of time and the way it shapes people and the way it shapes record keeping and um what is kept and what is not so like she goes into archives and things like that and like one of the books like Femina that I was reading last month I think it was archives keep a lot of things by men but not necessarily value things by women and so that comes into play as well I don't want to say too much but I just I really do love this book so so much okay that is it that is all the books um I have pulled to recommend you for the autumn spooky season time if you want to read any of these please let me know if you've read in these and want to discuss them again please let me know I have read all of these books and that's why I'm recommending them to you and these are books that I have thoroughly enjoyed for many different reasons so I'm more than happy to talk about them with you if you want to let me know that you were here but you don't want to necessarily leave a big comment leave me some kind of like autumnal or spooky emoji down in the comments thanks so much for watching and I will see you in the next video bye oh.